O children of Zion, be glad and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given the early rain for your vindication. He has poured down for your abundant rain, the early and the later rain as before. The threshing floors shall be full of grain, the vats shall overflow with wine and oil. I will repay you for the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, and the cutter, my great army which I sent against you. You shall eat plenty and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord, your God, who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never again be put to shame. You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I, the Lord, am your God, and there is no other. And my people shall never again be put to shame. Then afterward I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female slaves, in those days I will pour out my spirit. I will show portents in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be those who escape, as the Lord has said, and among the survivors there shall be those whom the Lord calls. Our second reading is from Luke, chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like the other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, I give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even look up to heaven, but he was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. For all whom exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. The word of the Lord. So some dreams you don't even know you have a dream for until it starts to come into focus. And that happened to me about 11 years ago when I was working with uh, Strength for the Journey retreats for people living with HIV and AIDS, and I was asked to go to our, one of our district conferences and to present uh, what we did at camp. And we brought, I made up that nice little foam board display for my table and had it sitting there with brochures so people could see what this camp was all about. And it just so happened I was stationed next to Mac McKinney. And Mac uh, was there and he had his foam board and his brochures about a trip that they were going to take to South Africa to build a church. And so as we had a lull in the festivities, we were there by ourselves, and so we started to chat. And he told me about the trip, and that they were going to this northern part of South Africa, which is a very rural place, and it was a place where, um, during apartheid, people bust from Johannesburg up to this place to get them out of the way of the whites that lived in the city. And in, so I said, well, you know, I've always wondered about what it must be like to live in South Africa. And because of my involvement with the AIDS issue, I'm concerned and, and, uh, about those in that part of the world. And, um, you know, I wonder, do you, did you talk to anybody about this subject? And he says, well, not really, but I do know that there isn't any health care for the people there in that part of the world. And that in that village, the church is both the medical clinic, the social worker place where clothes are distributed, where food is distributed, and that becomes the hub of the center. And he said, by the way, it's mostly women because all the men are away in the mines or they have died. And so 
I started to think about it. He says, you know, you should come with us. And I thought, oh yeah, right, me go to South Africa, you know, that, that, that can happen. I have a church, I have a family, how could, how could that possibly be a, anything that I could do? And he said, you know, if you're worried about the money, we help you raise the money for it, and, and what we do is we ask our churches to partner with us. And so he said, and what we're doing is we're building this church out of bricks, and the bricks will be sponsored, each one, by someone in your congregation. You'll, they'll pay uh, $100 for a brick. And so by the time that you sell your bricks, you'll have enough to pay for the trip, and then some. And I thought, oh yeah, that's a great idea. Our church struggles with paying our budget. There's no way that they'd pay for more things to give. But as I thought about it and prayed about it and I talked to Linda about it, the more I started to think, you know, maybe this is something I could do. Maybe this could be something I could be a part of. And then I saw him at annual conference, and we, again, were side by side in our booths, and he was talking about Africa to everybody who came along, and I was talking to people about strength for the journey, and I got to talking to him more, and the more we talked, the more I thought, oh, Maybe I could do this. And so, as time went by, I presented it to my church. They were enthusiastic. They bought bricks. And I was, before I knew it, I was on the plane to Johannesburg, flying to build a church in Hopiscope. I only, I, that's not exactly how you say it, but that's how I can say it. But Hopiscope. And so we got off the plane and we huddled into the vans and, you know, the driver's seat is on the wrong side there, so we, that was a little interesting. But we drove up, and as we were driving up the highway, it was about a three-hour drive from the airport. As we got close, we passed this crumbling stone tower along the side of the road, and Max said to me, by the way, that's, that's one of the guard towers. So when they bust people up here, they put guard towers so that it, they could not escape and go back down to the city. And then we saw people who were collecting grass on the side of the road, and they would bundle up this grass, and they leave it on the side, and they said, oh, that's for people um, to build their houses. And soon we came to the village where we were going to stay, and on the side of the road were all these grass huts with little fires going on outside, and people were living and sweeping and all kinds of things. And I met our United Methodist Volunteer and Mission Coordinator, Jim, who works and lives in South Africa. And his job is to, to accept these work teams to go over there, volunteers and mission, and to help them through their mission project. And Jim grew up in Texas. But he went to South Africa on a work team some years before that, fell in love with South Africa, and decided when the job opened up, he would take that position. Now, just a side note, that is one of the people that you support in your apportionment giving each time we give to our conference and world conference services. You support people like Jim who are in those places that receive these work teams. He was great. He told me about what was going on, and I asked him about, I asked him about what, what response did the Methodist Church have in that part of the world to people living with HIV and AIDS. And he told me that where he lived in Johannesburg, there was a clinic where people would come and they would receive their diagnosis. They'd get their blood tests done, and they would come to that place, and, and they would go in the front door of the clinic, and then they'd get their diagnosis, and go out the back door. And he said, what the Methodist church did was that they saw the need of the people who had just received their diagnosis to have resources provided for them, so they built an outreach center right behind the back door of the clinic. And so if you get a positive diagnosis, you can walk into the Methodist clinic and receive health information and social work um, sort of stuff like where to go to get your health 
care in Johannesburg. He said, but where we were going, people didn't have access. They would have to take that journey of three hours, maybe five hours, six hours on a bus to get to a hospital from where we were going. And so in the, in, in the process of getting there, we saw, we got to the work site, and at the work site there was a steel frame, and that was all that was a part of the church already built for us. And it was up to us then to lay the concrete foundation and then to take the bricks and to start stacking them up. And we didn't know, I didn't ever lay bricks before. How many people have laid bricks before? Right? So some of you have. So you know, we got a little tutoring, tutoring of how you lay bricks. And, you know, I never knew this and never thought about it before, but when you lay bricks, you don't stack them on top of one another like this on the wall because what happens? It falls over, goes boom, right? So you have to stagger your bricks so they look something like that. And so Joseph, who is uh, our foreman, was this little, little guy, and he had this bright smile, and he taught us all to take the daga, which is the concrete mix, and spread it on the brick and to lay them there. And then he showed us how to keep them parallel to the ground so that we could learn how to build a wall. And so we did so. And here's the thing. We took the list of names of people who had donated the bricks and we wrote their name on each one of the bricks that we were about to lay, took a picture of it, and then put that brick with their name into the wall as we were building this new church. And so literally, they, we, the people back home were a part of us as we were laying the bricks. And I had, prior to going, filled out a calendar and asked people to pray each day that we were on this trip. So not only did we have their support by the name on the list for the brick, but we had the, their support of prayer. And as we laid the bricks, we learned a lot of mistakes that we could there's a lot of ways not to lay the brick right. I found a lot of them. So they put me on the back wall, <laughs> further away from for you from the front. And, um, and as we did so, it was not so much about getting the church done. It was building the relationships with the people we had there. We had one woman who would come and she would sing for us as we worked. We had another woman who came and she knitted um, things and, uh, and sold them to us so we could bring them home. And, and then there was the pastor would come and help lay bri bricks. And, and this particular pastor had a circuit. You remember Methodists? We used to have circuit riders. In South Africa, they still have them. They travel on motorcycles, not horses, but they're still working that way. And his route included 30 churches. The size of Rhode Island was his circuit. And so, but in that time, he came and helped lay brick with us. And why, I asked him, well, what happens in churches? I mean, you can't be in 30 churches all the time. And he says, well, a lot of the laymen and women do all the work while I'm not there. And it's really up to them to um, run the church. And I did meet a few of the lay lay preachers that were there, and I asked them about how the AIDS epidemic had impacted their communities, and they talked about how they were devastated. People would, would die, and children would be orphaned, and then we found out that there was an organization nearby that um, helped with, with the orphans, but that they had very little, and so at the last minute, we took some of our resources. We organized a gathering on a Saturday and hosted the orphans. And we had brought school supplies with us because we were told the John Wesley uh, school in town needed school supplies. And when we got there, they didn't need them because they had been uh, uh, accepted into the governmental school system. And so they had all the supplies they needed. So we ended up taking the school supplies, putting them into gift baskets and having the orphans come on a Saturday, fed them, 
and gave them a little gift basket so that they could take those home and be in school. And so as we built the bricks, as we saw this church starting to rise, one thing we learned about bricks, and when it comes to the end, so when the, when the bricks come to the corner of the walls in, in a house, you don't think about this until you look at them, but you have to fill in these kind of, you know, it's okay when you have things move, but a lot of times you'd come to the end of the wall and there'd be sort of this sort of configuration, so you'd have to crack a brick in half or in quarter to fill in that little gap to make it flush in the corner of the building. And the other thing we found about bricks is that the way they fire bricks in South Africa is they put them together in molds by hand, and then when they're dry enough, they stack them on a big pile with a fire underneath, and they light the fire, and the, and the bricks get fired in the open air. But these particular bricks we got were not that great. Uh, Jim, our volunteer coordinator, said that. He said, oh, these are, these are not. So, so some of the bricks were a little crook, cr curved. Some of them had um, chips cut off of them. Some of them had... Uh, would crack when you, when you try to stack them on the, you know, you go up there, put it on the wall, and it crack in half. And so we had this little pile of rejected brick over here. But when it came to these things, we went to that pile so that we could fill in and make it flush in the corners of the building. And so I was invited to preach in this congregation that Sunday, and we had half uh, we, we, as we preached, we had a portable pulpit. The United Methodist women from one of the churches had, had made a beautiful altar cloth like this, so we put that over the altar. Um, and then uh, I preached, and I talked about these rejected pieces of brick. And I looked at the people there, and I said, you know, I understand that in your history, there are people that rejected you and brought you to this place as a way of getting you out of their way. And now those days are gone. And so you are the cornerstone for a new church. You are the ones that are going to build a new hope in this place. And I said, and so as a reminder, I want you to take one of these pieces of brick and keep that with you at all times to remind you that even though you'll feel rejected there'll be times that will happen still that God does not reject you that God builds a whole new church a whole new vision because of you and so we pass the plate around just like you would communion and we worshiped together, and we sang great hymns. I learned a lot on that trip. It was a dream, as I said, that had come true that I didn't even know that I had. But it was a way that I learned how, first of all, that this money that we give every Sunday, it goes to people to save their lives and to bring hope in places that we may never visit places like South Africa, that there'll be a connection forever for me in that place. And, and um, recently, when I was going through some things at my parents' home, I found the little certificate with the picture of their brick that they had given in honor of Neil and Norma Marshall that are now part of that church. So I learned that we can touch the lives of others in the places that we may never visit. We can build new hope and a new future for the world by helping one another, especially in those times when we feel rejected, those times where we may not be connected to someone. We may feel isolated or alone, or we may encounter someone in our community that is alone who felt rejected at some point in their lives. So we have built a wonderful church here in this place so that people can see this 
as a beacon of hope and justice and peace. And my experience in South Africa taught me that I'm not there to save them. In fact, in a lot of ways, they helped save me. And so as we think of the scriptures this morning of how Joel said, talked about the shower of blessings that would restore the people there after the locusts had um, eaten them out of house and home, so to speak, and brought poverty and suffering in the world. Joel says there's a whole new way now that God is acting in the world, and, and we can be a part of that as we dream new dreams, as we see visions for the future, as we continue as God's children in the world. And so as we began this kind of thought about what we are to invest in our church's future in this place and in, in the greater church and how it works in the world, as we think about what it is that we individually can do to invest our time and energy into this brave new world that we may not even know what is going to happen, but we can dream the dreams, have the visions. What would it be like for our community not to have any homeless? What would it be like for everyone in our community to be fed and not worry about where their next meal may come from? What would it mean for those who have been uh, addicted to drugs and alcohol find a whole new life and, and be able to stand proudly and know that God is working in their lives? And there's so many other things that we can talk about as far as... But, what is that vision, and how then can we make that vision possible? As we had the town hall meetings, one of the, one of the people said that we need to be financially stable in order to do this, right? So we don't like to talk about money in a church a lot, but John Wesley had this saying of saying that money is not bad in itself. He even came up with the slogan, you know, give, uh, earn all you can, give all you can. But he said, we have to do that as humbly as possible. Not to say that we earn this blessing of life and all that we receive, but to give thanks for it. To re recognize that it's been a blessing and that we have been blessed by those who've come before us. We've been blessed by our friends and our family. We've been blessed by our church family. And out of that blessing, out of that thanksgiving, then we give so that we recognize our sense of building a new church, our part in it. You know, I was, we, the first thing we did when we got to the work site is we had to put on a tin roof on this steel structure. And so here I am, afraid of heights, up on this roof, screwing in uh, bolts with a portable generator that is fueled by gasoline because there's no electricity with this long extension cord and I'm up there and I'm drilling the sheet um, metal onto the frame and I looked up, I looked around and I said, I'm building a church in South Africa. <laughs> How amazing is that? I hope that we have that same enthusiasm as we move forward as a congregation and as a denomination. Look at what we are building in the community. Look at what we are a part of. And what can we celebrate? And how can we have joy as we do so? Giving all that we can doesn't mean that we suffer. It's because we are grateful with our entire heart, mind, and body to give to God something that God can use to build not only physical churches, but build a life for people in our community so that they can dream new dreams and have new visions for their lives. So as I suggested in my newsletter article, which will be coming out, let's begin this season by taking a moment every day and giving thanks.
I don't know what it would be for. It might be for glasses. It could be for uh, something that happened in your life that day or something that happened the day before or something that you never gave thanks for that happened years ago. Whatever it is, let's begin thinking about what God is calling us to do by giving thanks and continuing that the whole month of November so that we remember what it is that we've been given. We give praise and thanksgiving for that so that we then can know how God is calling us to be, what God is calling us to be, what the vision God sees for us in our lives as individuals and as a congregation. Amen.